I'm now pleased to introduce our first speaker, uh, Stephen Gates, who will share with us uh, the research on youth homelessness. Steve is director of the Canadian Homelessness Research Network and associate professor in the Faculty of Education at York University. His research on homelessness, homeless youth is focused on their economic strategies, health, education, and legal and justice issues. And more recently, he has focused his attention on the Canadian response to homelessness. He has also led Canada's first national research conference on homelessness at New York University in 2001. Uh, welcome. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm I'm delighted to be here, uh, mostly because of, I think this is such an exciting time we had around youth homelessness. Things have changed dramatically from five years ago. And uh, so what I want to talk about is um, some of the things that I've learned about uh, how we can more effectively respond to homelessness. And this comes from looking at great Canadian examples, but also from elsewhere in the world, including Australia and uh, the United Kingdom, the United States, Ireland, elsewhere in Europe. Even though the policy contexts are different, what did you say? One minute to go. <laughs> <laughs> no, Steve, I've already told you to throw something in. <laughs> He's going to yell at me at some point. Even though the policy contexts are different, we can adapt models and apply them elsewhere. Here's the master of adaptation here. We spend a lot of time talking about that. And the idea is you know, to take the essence of a, a, a model or an approach and how do you make it work locally. I think that's an important thing to understand that we can learn from elsewhere. From so, so I'm going to just, on well, my presentation, I'm just going to do an overview of youth homelessness in Canada and then talk about what we're doing. Okay. So the number is, you see that white number, 22,000, 45,000. That's because we don't really know how many homeless people are. We don't have a good system of uh, counting uh, that's shared across the country yet, but I think that's a fair figure for on any given way. Um, Characteristics of the population from the research perspective. Uh, most research shows that two out of three homeless youth are male, but some homeless populations are overrepresented, including Aboriginal youth, and that's even more the case the farther west you go in Canada. Uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual youth are overrepresented, which suggests that homophobia is a major cause of homelessness. Uh, research shows that, you know, maybe this won't be so unusual, but Many young people cycle in and out of homelessness fairly quickly, but those that stay more chronically, it's an average stay of four years, which is a pretty devastating figure when you consider the developmental needs of any teenager, to consider that they're homeless for four years. The other thing I think is important to consider is that age difference matters when we talk about homeless youth. There are young people under 16 who are homeless, and the sector, certainly in Toronto, has probably true in most places in Canada for legal reasons, has difficulty addressing the needs of the very young homeless people. 16 to 18 year olds' needs are going to be different than 19 to 25. So, causes of homelessness. I like to frame it like this, there are individual and relational factors that come into play, right? So, problems people might have with family members or friends or school. Uh, there are structural factors including poverty, as I mentioned before, homophobia, racism, with lack of affordable housing, lack of economic opportunities for young people, shifts and changes in the, uh, the labor market that mean that people have to have more and more qualifications now. And then the third piece is that there are systems failures. And that includes child protection services, the fact that we know that a high percentage of homeless youth come from child protection services, either they're fleeing care or they've aged out. But it also means that people are leaving corrections with no discharge planning and are discharged into homelessness or leaving mental health care. Right? So it's important to think about the causes of homelessness because this gives you a hint as to where the solutions are going to lie. Uh, so the Canadian response to homelessness, where are we now? I like to talk about responding to homelessness as being fairly straightforward. There's two things you need to think about. First, prevention. Stop people from becoming homeless in the first place. The second, the emergency response. What are you going to do for people when a bad thing happens? They wind up homeless. And then the third piece is moving people out of homelessness. Now, if I were to characterize the first phase of the Canadian response to homelessness, it's that we've invested heavily in the middle part, not so much on the first or the third part. That's changing, which is 
good. Um, but that, this is a, I, this is probably true in most countries. I'd suggest Australia probably had that phase where that was the, you know, the main response. Um, but what does emergency response mean? It means investment in emergency shelters where people may stay on and on or be shuffled from shelter to shelter. They have minimum space, that kind of thing, which disrupts a person's ability to stabilize. Drop-ins, soup kitchens, specialized programs. So these are the more charitable responses that come from the emergency response. But the other thing that we typically don't talk about, which is key and part of the emergency response, is the criminalization of homelessness. When we keep people in a state of visible homelessness, the public gets annoyed, politicians get annoyed, and one of the responses is, let, you know, we have to make it less visible. And so we have laws, new laws put in place to uh, ban panhandling and but we also have the application of existing laws in a disproportionate way. So that many young people wind up, while they're homeless, with incredible amounts of tickets and get stopped and searched regularly. Many interactions with police, which means that they often wind up going to jail, right? which is going to further drill them down into the ground. So the key challenges here are that most places in Canada, well, many communities don't have any youth homelessness services at all, right? But uh, most places, if they do have them, it's not necessarily very coordinated. There are, but that's changing. Uh, an additional problem, I think, in our response homeless is that we often place the responsibility for solving it within the sector, right? So if there are mental health issues with street youth, the mainstream sector gets off the hook, mainstream services and supports, corrections is let off the hook, they should be responsible for ensuring people don't wind up in moving into homelessness. Uh, child protection services. Uh, and when we do that kind of response, focusing on the whole sector as having to take care of everything, it also reinforces the idea that the people who are homeless are separate from us. Right? There's a whole other set of services for them, they're different, and their needs are different. It also gives the people a sense that the needs are taken care of. I hear this in Toronto all the time. You know, people say, well, they get a lot of needs, and uh, they got a place to stay, what do you want? And in fact, in spite of all our food provision services, research shows fairly conclusively that homeless youth are malnourished. Right? So the system isn't eating, basically. So, I'll give you a short story here. Uh, there's a, a guy who's like walking or on his hands and knees under a streetlight. And, you know, looking around, and somebody comes and says, what do you mean? He says, I lost my wallet. And the guy goes, what do you mean, you lost your wallet? can't find it here? He says, yeah. Are you sure you lost it here? He says, no, I lost it over on the other side of the road. He goes, well, why are you here? He goes, because the light's better. Right? The idea is that sometimes we think we're doing the right thing, but we're missing the point entirely. And I think that our response to homelessness has often been that way. That we get trapped into thinking that the emergency response is the way to respond to homelessness. Emergency response and so on. So, thinking about youth homelessness, I'm going to do the timeline. 15 minutes? Okay. 20 minutes or so? Okay. I think the challenge in Canada, and this is where we're going, is can we move from this model with that big investment in emergency to something that looks more like this, right? You're always going to need that emergency response, but we need to transform what that is and put more resources into prevention and moving these out of homelessness. And so to do this, there are some key essentials that I think are important to consider. The first is the need for a youth-specific focus, and that's why the CHRA uh, uh, policy position is really important. We need to highlight that the causes of youth homelessness are unique compared to adult homelessness, and therefore the solutions we need. We're talking about adolescents. We need to start with the fact that they're young people and understand what are their needs, uh, and therefore adopt a youth development approach into our response to youth homelessness. Um, okay, we need to engage the right players. That means, I think, all levels of government, but also the unusual suspects as well. Uh, mainstream service as well as the homelessness sector. We need young people involved in the so developing the solutions, right? Because they have knowledge and experience that matters, rather than always imposing things upon them, which we tend to do with adolescents anyway. This is good for you. Right? Uh, that's our model of education. Right? And leadership's the key. We are talking about that, I mean, you can have lots of good ideas out there, but somebody in your community has got to grab the reins and say, we're going to do something about this. Okay. 
The third thing, and this is something I think we're finding out homeless is generally, is that you need a coordinated systems approach. Having a whole bunch of homeless services is not a system. The services have to be integrated. People have to have different roles. They have to work together. And not only that, the system has to reach out beyond the homeless receptor, right? So you have to bring in the mainstream services like healthcare and corrections and child protection in developing a solution. You need that strategic coordination, and you also need, here's the research document, you need research, right? Which for a long time, people have been kind of averse to about what the research tell us. You need data gathering, right? Because we need to know if it makes a difference. So what we do have any impact. We might think it's great, maybe it's not doing anything. And we need information sharing, which is you know the ability to, if there are good ideas out there, how do we get them shared around? Uh, key program components, I think we need to, for, for youth, we need to really focus more on prevention. We need to ensure that there's a case management orientation so that the system <coughs> somebody's at risk of homelessness, or the minute they become homeless, the minute they touch the sector, that's that case management falls in place and that people don't get lost in the, you know, the, the web of, of emergency services. And then there are four pillars uh, to, that I think are important. And this I got when we were in the UK several years ago, and then I also, listening to Sheldon earlier this year, I thought, wow, it's the same thing. There are four basic things I think we need to think about when we're talking about youth. We, we, they need a combination of housing and support. People need income. Right, and young people are competing in a job market that's difficult. My kids still live at home. I have a 48 model at my house. Just so you know. Um, they, they can stay as long as they want and move forward. Uh, we need to focus on not just employment training, but education as well. And that's a key thing I think with your program, Children that I love, is that you, it's not just like let's train you up, it's let's get you educated because in the current job market, if you don't have a high school degree, like credentialism matters more and more. I don't think we're really helping people if we just, you know, help you learn how to fix a computer or something. But it doesn't matter what the training is. People need support and education if we want a long-term successful outcome. And then we have to have the necessary supports tailored to the needs of the individual. Right, and the needs are going to be different. Some people are going to have addictions issues, some people have mental health issues, either with themselves or with their family. And so we need to make sure that we give people the proper supports based on their age, based on other identity issues. And then finally, we need to move away from what is and work. So we need to retool that emergency sector. We're going to need it, but I think the job is different now. The other thing we have to do is stop criminalization of homelessness. We just did a recent study that shows, that, like, the Many young people wind up with thousands and thousands of dollars in ticket debt. The second they get housed, there's a knock on the door from a collection agency because the cities you know, sell the debt to collection agencies. And it's like, you now are earning minimum wage and you now owe $4,800. Or owe $4,800. It's like so counterproductive. It's an example of policy making. <coughs> so, let's focus on prevention here. What do we mean by prevention? The basic approach you know, that Hal Pawson, who's now living in Australia, and uh, Dennis Culhane have argued is you need to, you know, you modify the public health model of uh, prevention, uh, which involves primary, secondary, tertiary. So I'm going to try to apply that to you. Folks. Primary prevention means initiatives and investments that prevent new cases, so you work way upstream. And this isn't necessarily the job of the homelessness sector, but the homelessness sector has a role in ensuring that that kind of primary prevention or supporting that happening. So the places that I think are more successful have in, insert in the education system supports. And that's in Australia with the Family uh, Connect program, and in the UK they do that a lot. So they place resources and services in the school as sort of a, you know, canary in the mind shop to detect if people are in crisis or if they're family problems, that kind of thing. And sometimes interventions can flow right from that. We need to ensure there's affordable housing supply and have an anti-poverty strategy. All the great solutions we have around housing first and other models can't work if you don't have affordable housing, right? You have to have that. We need to have family supports because sometimes families struggle with what to do with young people. Uh, we need risk assessment tools and student engagement. We also need to reform, you know, to go back to the causes of homelessness, we need to reform the systems that are flowing people into homelessness. We 
not acceptable for corrections to be done to people into the police system. Reforming child welfare is much more complicated, but we, again, that's where we can learn from elsewhere in the world and see, and in Canada, because it's different problems by province. But we need to work to make sure that uh, people leaving child protection services have options other than a homeless shelter. So I've got some case studies here. I don't think I've to go through with them. But just to say that in uh, the UK and Australia, some of these upstream <coughs> efforts are in place. And I don't see why we couldn't imagine that in Canadian communities. Secondary prevention, and this is where the, the homelessness sector really steps in. This is interventions when somebody becomes or is about to become homeless. So how do we start, stop that from happening? And so again, School-based supports, like it amazes me in Ontario, the school boards are absent from this whole issue, right? And that makes no sense because every I can guarantee that virtually every young person who comes homeless is a school board, right? And so, like, why aren't we there? The schools don't know what to do. People disappear from school. The teachers don't know what to do. We need to get into the school. We need that common assessment framework and case management approach again. So when people touch the sector. It instantly supports and interventions go into place. And the goal should be to divert people from the emergency sector as much as possible. Um, so here's a model of what that looks like, right? So when somebody gets assessed, there are, for, for some young people, the possibility of going home or having support from their family as they move through homelessness is there. And he was, uh, you know, has that pioneering family reconnect program, right? So, you know, you help work with the family to get the young person back home or with family support move into housing. And with the family support, that's important. And if I can just pause, those of you who work in the sector will know this, and the research certainly shows this too, that most young people who are homeless, even if they had a horrific background, still often long for family, right? For family connections. So even if you've had, come from an abusive situation, doesn't mean that every relationship in your family is damaged, right? It's a resource that we don't use, right? So people either we need to move them back, help them move back, and that may mean family mediation, may mean work with the family and the young person, because uh, sometimes things just blow up. Um, but the other thing is that many people won't be able to go back home. So we need a, a rapid rehousing strategy, because the longer some young person gets mired in the emergency sector, the worse it is. I can leave the yellow card. <laughs> so, again, there are some really good examples here. Family mediation, family reconnect, and as I said, Eva's uh, model, which is now being adapted elsewhere. Intake and assessment. I love the model that they have in the UF or UK, the common assessment. And I also love this idea of timeout housing, respite housing in the UK, where they provide people, and I think Kelly's adopting this, right? Mm -hmm. No? Okay. <laughs> Why are you talking about? <laughs> well, it's, what it is is you work with families that have an extra room, and when a young person does that, that blow up at home, they don't go to the homeless shelter. They go to this respite housing where they get clothing and support, and the casework starts right then and there. And sometimes, because sometimes people just need like a cooling off period, right? But like both the parents or the young person, like things explode, it's like get the hell out of here or I'm leaving. And sometimes you just need to like help people settle down and give them support so they can move back home. <laughs> Sheldon said three minutes, which I'm not good at math, I'm an anthropologist, so that sounds like five. Anyway. Okay, tertiary prevention is investments and initiatives that assist people who are chronically homeless and are in need of support. So this is like breaking the cycle of homelessness. Right? So once people are homeless, what can we do to keep them from becoming homeless again? And so, we need to retool the work of the, home, of the emergency sector so it focuses not so much on warehousing people uh, to actually helping people get into housing, the kind of housing they need. And there are different models and debates about you know, transitional housing. Some people have, uh, don't think that that's appropriate. I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure with youth it isn't appropriate because the, one of the things that distinguishes young people from adults is they have no prior experience of living independently. And so, uh, and so I think with young people, all houses transitional anyway, right? They're not buying houses. Um, we need to help connect people back to communities, and we need to reduce legal and service barriers, which are huge. Everybody will know that young people get caught, mired in difficulties getting access to benefits in their rights. 
And so case studies, here's an interesting model, the FOIA, which I know is in Australia, certainly in the UK. Uh, it's one that we're looking at piloting in Canada, but adapting it so that it's integrated with the housing first model. So it's not a transitional housing model so much, but in fact is a, uh, uh, so it gives people access to stay as long as they want. The, the reason this kind of model is good, because often transitional housing in Canada is limited to one year or less, right? And that's often because of what funders allow. That makes no sense, right? Because you have to ask yourself, would that work for Europe, a teenager, right? My kids get more than that. As I said, they're still at home. So as I say, I have a FOIA model of my house. So they get life skills. They're expected to be in school or training or work or all three. They get support with the issues that they need, right? It's a model that I think is really built around what an adolescent means, right? And an adolescence is not something that happens in one year, believe me. So, Finally, we need to consider what works and for whom, and I think that's it. Well, yeah, I just want to go through quickly where I think action is in Canada. So we have Hamilton, St. John's, I think is good, Kelowna, Calgary. Um, in the CHRA, like at the national level, we have some important initiatives. The policy statement on youth homelessness is going to give communities some good direction on what to do. EVA's initiative, of course, is doing, and has been for years, doing a lot of important work uh, with its national initiative program, learning community. Uh, raising the Roof has been doing work around youth and, and helping uh, promote uh, um, you know, issues around youth for years. And Calgary Homeless Foundation, it has, which I believe is like the first strategic uh, plan to end youth homelessness in Canada. It's a very interesting document, and we'll see in three years, I guess, a report on that. Canadian Homelessness Research Network, very cool organization. You should, you should join, you should join this <laughs> So anyway, we're working on a whole bunch of stuff, including this fall, we're releasing a book on youth homelessness with media research, et cetera, et cetera. And I mean, you get the music's playing. <laughs> so, one of the benefits of, you know, one of the benefits of, uh, yeah, I guess, working in this sector is over time, you become friends with people you work with, which really means you can, no, you don't have to be nice to it. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. We stopped that long ago. Yeah, we did. I don't know if we ever started. <coughs> anyway.